My name is Kieran O'Connor. I lecture in medieval archaeology at NUI Goway. And today we're just going to speak for a few minutes about Roscommon Abbey. Roscommon Abbey is the building that you see behind me. Now, in a way, the term abbey is a misnomer because it's actually a Dominican priory. It was founded in 1253 by Phelim O'Connor, the King of Connacht at the time, for the Dominican Order. The Dominican Order uh, was founded in the early 13th century by a Spanish priest. I, the first Dominican houses um, were founded in Ireland in the 1220s. But Roscommon Priory is regarded as the first Dominican house in Ireland that was founded solely in a Gaelic context. Irish princes, Gaelic Irish princes like Phelim O'Connor, had patronised the Dominicans before uh, in conjunction with Anglo-Norman lords. For example, at Athen Rye in 1241, uh, and again, I think uh, Phelim O'Connor was probably involved in the foundation of Sligo Friary in um, 1252. Uh, but the main patron was Morris Fitzgerald, an Anglo-Norman lord. So in a way, we can argue that this is the first, uh, if you like, complete Dominican Priory founded by a native Irish prince. Why did Phelim bring the Dominicans to Roscommon in the mid 13th century. Well, he clearly was impressed by their spirituality and the fact that they were, you know, had, had already in the 30 years or so, 40 years since they'd been uh, founded, not even 40 years, had gained a, a reputation for being tremendous preachers and orators. And I think Phelim wanted the Dominicans to come and give spiritual guidance through um, preaching and things like that to the people in the, in the area of Roscommon. Of course, a great prince, if you like, or lord like Phelim, wanted to patronize the church to atone for sins, but also to show his status as uh, a great lord. You know, this was seen all over Europe at the time. So it's, it's quite interesting, Phelim's foundation of Roscommon Priory in the mid 13th century. But why did the Dominicans come to Roscommon? What was in it for them? Well, increasing work is showing that Roscommon, certainly by the 11th or 12th century, if not far earlier, had become a very important monastery. Uh, the, the actual original monastery of Roscommon lay to our north on the site of where the uh, St. Comyn's uh, Church of Ireland Church is today. Uh, there's clear that it's clear that there was a lot of intellectual activity being carried out in Roscommon, particularly in the 12th century, under the patronage of uh, the monastery, which adopted the Augustinian rule in the 12th century, but also under the patronage of the O'Connor Kings of Connacht. So we think that uh, Roscommon in the mid 13th century, and for at least a century or two beforehand, had become a great center of learning and also art as well. So the Dominicans were associated with learning across Europe at this time. It would also appear that Roscommon under the O'Connors in the 13th century had developed into a town. Um, that it was more than just a sort of collection of new, you know, a few houses. It had, it had actually developed into a small town. And this is kind of interesting because there is one if you like scholarly belief, that there was little in the way of towns in uh, Gaelic dominated parts of medieval Ireland. But increasing uh, evidence is showing that that's not the case. So what we have here in 1253, when the Dominicans uh, are brought here by Phelim O'Connor, is probably a centre of learning at Roscommon, a centre of metalworking, artistic endeavour, uh, 
but also an O'Connor um, administrative centre in this part of their kingdom of Connacht. And we also believe that there was an O'Connor residence on the, the exact opposite side of town to where we are now, on the northern side, and that may have been a Cranog. So all in all, uh, in the mid-13th century, this was an attractive place for the Dominicans to come and build and you know, start their priory. In terms of its history, the history of the Priory is very much uh, that of Roscommon throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, we have references to uh, Priors of Roscommon becoming Bishops of El Finn. Uh, we have references to um, academic activity being carried out here. We hear of uh, an O'Kearneen Lector of Roscommon, Dominican Friar who uh, was, was a, a famous scholar in the early 14th century. We hear of the Priory being burned in the fighting, if you like, between the O'Connors and the Anglo-Normans. We know that, that um, Roscommon Priory was burned, I think, in 1270. Um, you know, so things like that. In the mid-15th century, about, well, 1445, we might talk about this a bit later, we hear that the Priory has been damaged by war and neglect and the, the Dominicans here get a papal indulgence to carry out building repairs. But then with the Reformation, the reconquest of Ireland by the English government in Dublin, Roscommon Abbey is confiscated from and the small amount of lands attached to the Priory, it's confiscated by the Dublin government and eventually is granted to a new English administrator, Sir Nicholas Mulby. The Dominicans seem to have left the Priory, but they continue to live in the town of Roscommon. And that uh, community existed well into the 19th century. But for our purposes, after about 1570 or so, the priory here uh, was laicized, if you like, and became the property of various new English uh, settlers. Here we are in the in Roscommon Priory itself, in Roscommon Abbey. We're actually located at present in its nave. Now the thing about abbeys and friaries and priories, and for that matter castles, they were used for many centuries. And over time, um, new repairs, new features were inserted uh, in, into the building. So what you actually have is chronological depth uh, within, the within the structure. So as we said just a few minutes, a few minutes ago, the Abbey was founded in 1253. It's dedicated in 1257, meaning that it probably took three or four years to actually build uh, uh, the, the, the priory here at Roscommon. Uh, there is a 13th century phase, but things change over time, needs, different rituals, things like that. And in the mid 15th century, we find that there is a rebuilding of the priory. This just doesn't happen in Roscommon uh, Abbey, but it happens right across the country. The 15th century saw a lot of building of new friaries and priories and rebuildings of older abbeys and priories like Roscommon. What do we know about the Dominican friars who actually lived at and served and worked at Roscommon Priory? We have references to them in the historical sources, particularly uh, in the native annals. And in terms of their status, the priest friars tended to come from the local ruling families, the O'Connors, McDermott's, O'Hanley's, O'Burns, and also the old learned families and ecclesiastical families of pre-Norman Ireland, like the O'Kearneans and O'Dignans. So in a general sense, you know, all are equal in the eyes of God, but some are more equal than others. The priest friars, you know, the actual Dominican friars, tended to come from the upper echelons of society. There were also lay friars, and we do occasionally hear of them. And mostly, 
they come from a lower status background. That's what I meant uh, in one sense. All are equal in the eyes of God, but some are more equal than others. Uh, but So basically, lay friars tended to come from lower status backgrounds, and they did the manual work and odd jobs, if you like, around the priory, while the priest friars tended to do, you know, say mass every day, preach to the laity, give spiritual services to the laity in the vicinity, and also carry out study. Uh, because as, as I implied early, earlier, studied, study was very important to the Dominicans throughout their existence. In a general sense, the Dominicans were not supposed to personally own property. They were to live a life of austerity and poverty, whether they were um, fri you know, pri priest, fri ordained friars or lay friars. And normally what would happen is that the local families would donate food, money, etc. to the friars. But it's also clear, at least in Ireland, and I'm not sure if this happens elsewhere in medieval Europe at this time, that there was a small farm attached to the friary, presumably to grow food, uh, you know, grow vegetables and crops, maybe a small dairy herd, some sheep. Not, the produce was not sold for profit, but was used by the friars themselves. In other words, they were somewhat self-sufficient in terms of food. Uh, and we know at Roscommon that the priory here seemed to have had about 50 acres attached to it. So it's not like the monasteries of the time, we'll say Cistercian monasteries in the 13th century, had literally thousands, owned thousands of acres and farmed vast tracts of land uh, for profit. The Dominicans were poor, they maintained that, they relied on donations, as I say, from local people, but there does appear to have been a small farm attached to the Priory. And that might be a little different to what was happening, at least in places like England or Eastern Ireland at the time. At the west end of the Priory Church, the West Gable. Now remember I said a couple of minutes ago that we can see two architectural phases in this particular church. The original mid-13th century phase and then a, a, a rebuilding and renovation in the mid-15th century. And what we're going to do now is look through the building, the church, and try and figure out what exactly belongs to the 13th century that's original to the church when it was first built. And then when we finish that, we'll come back out here and go through the mid 15th century um, a, a renovation. Okay, so we're here at the West Gable. What do we see? The remains of a clear 15th century inserted window. But on either side, we see blocked up lancet windows. They are original to the church as it was built in the mid 13th century and they're blocked up in the 15th century. That's quite clear and it's so so clear here this is why we bring students from NUI Galway to look at this. So we're looking at a 13th century phase and an inserted window of 15th century. Now originally you've got to imagine that that, that trace read window inserted in the mid 15th century was not there obviously in the 13th century when the friary or priory was founded and we know from analogy elsewhere that there would have been a central lancet so you would have had three lancet long lancet pointed windows lighting the west gable of the church lighting the nave of the church. We see a doorway there today, but that's clearly a reconstructed or constructed structure of modern date. Maybe 
rebuilt or, or inserted in the 20th century. We're not quite sure at Roscommon if there was originally a doorway at the, we at the western end of the church because we think we know from antiquarian sources that there was a doorway on the northern wall of the nave of the church. We're now going to go into the nave and look at it. So the main thing there is 13th century lancets blocked up in the 15th century with an in inserted window in at that time in the mid, mid 15th century, destroying the central uh, lancet. Okay, we're moving into the nave. The nave is at the western end of the church, and this is where the laity, local lay people, would have come to hear mass, but also to be preached to by the Dominicans. The thing about this particular nave is it's, it has a unique feature, and that is it has an aisle to the, on, on its northern side. So in terms of uh, internal area, this nave is very large. And you know, when we were working here, we were thinking, okay, the nave is where the laity came and where you know, the Dominicans preached to the laity from um, a pulpit behind me. And also, obviously, mass, they heard mass here, things like that. Why is the nave so big? Because normally, the nave of a Dominican, or for that matter, a Franciscan friary, who are also a mendicant order, like the Dominicans, was usually long and narrow. Here, it has um, an extra aisle, if you like, attached onto its northern side. People will say, well, is that 15th century? Is that part of the renovation of the 15th century? No, it's not. It was original to the mid 13th century church. And it seems to me that perhaps one of the reasons why there's such a large nave was that both the Dominicans and Phelim O'Connor as King of Connacht, their patron and founder, realized that because Roscommon not only was there a nucleated you know, settlement at Roscommon, but also uh, that it was a center of pilgrimage, and that at certain times of the year, large amounts of people visited Roscommon. We also think that the parochial system in the Diocese of Elfin in the, Elfin in the 13th century was not as organized as dioceses further east. And overall, it could be that because Roscommon was a centre of pilgrimage, because there wasn't the same level of, we'll say, spiritual care and things like that within the Diocese of Elphin at the time, uh, that basically the Dominicans were expecting large numbers of people to come into the nave and therefore to, to hear, if you like, their, their, their sermons, to hear Mass, and that's why the aisle is Ad, you know, the original church had an aisle on its northern side, making its internal area much bigger than the average uh, Dominican, or for that matter, as I say, Franciscan friary. So originally there would have been uh, tombs of local lords, merchants, well-to-do people actually located uh, in these niches, which uh, lie on the southern wall of the nave of the Priory Church. So originally tomb niches. And actually the other thing you can see is the original um, mortar render on the wall. And we, we, you, we must remember that because what we see now is basically stone walls, but they would have been plastered originally, um, whitewashed, and also probably had um, red and ochre lines pretending to be ashlar masonry painted onto them. But I think the main thing is that the walls would have been plastered and whitewashed, perhaps with some simple 
painting, looking at the external southern wall of the nave. And the windows that you see uh, above me there are original 13th century lancet windows. And we know from antiquarian sources that the, the northern wall of the nave church, the northern wall actually of the aisle, also had similar lancets. These are classic 13th century lancet windows. So we know that that's part of the original uh, 13th century church as built in the 1250s of the Priory Church and originally we would have had uh, claustral buildings existing here. How do we know there were buildings here? How do we know? Well first of all we can see the scar of the roof up here, a scar of a roof. We can also just about make out humps and bumps in this field. We can see the remains of a wall coming out, one of the walls and basically we would have had a range around a central grassy area called the Cloister Garth and various buildings of some of which were you know two stories in height a ground floor and a first floor basically we would have had the sacristy although that's a little different here but we would have had the chapter house um, on the eastern side of, of this range, on the east range of these buildings, as I said a, a central grassy area above which you would have had the friars uh, dormitory at first floor level. The chapter house was where um, basically the business of the friary was discussed each day, prayers were said there, um, meetings were held there and what's interesting about the chapter house at Roscommon and indeed this whole area is that the discovery program carried out geophysical survey here about 10 years ago and they picked up the walls, the foundations of this range, the claustral range to the south of the Priory Church but they showed that the chapter house jutted out eastwards and was actually quite a large chapter house in comparison to other chapter houses in Ireland, in 13th century Ireland. And that may be an indication that there were quite a few uh, Dominican friars and lay friars at Roscommon at that time. What else? On the southern side of this range you would have had the kitchen and the dining room. Uh, the friar's dining room and also we probably had garderobes or lavatories uh, as well somewhere in the vicinity. Probably that southern range was, did not have, um, it was, was not of two floors, it was only a, a ground floor. A kitchen and refectory uh, where the friars would have ate. Again the tables ranged around the wall probably with a lectern in the middle and the friars would listen to one of their brethren um, read from the Bible or Gospel or whatever uh, during uh, mealtime. And then where we are at this, on this western side you would have had cellars um, you know, where, where food and things like that was stored and then at first floor level we would have had the accommodation for the lay friars and we can see that there's a blocked up doorway behind me where the lay friars would have filed into the church uh, at night during night offices. We're now in the choir of or chancel of the Priory Church. The nave where the laity would have heard Mass and been preached to by the Dominican friars was separated from this choir area in the 13th and 14th century by a rood screen, a wooden rood screen, which was basically a wooden screen with a cross uh, on top of it. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. The laity would not really have seen this part of the church. We know that the northern wall of the choir uh, 
from antiquarian sources had very similar lancet windows to what we see in the uh, what we what we just saw in the nave, but they were taken down uh, sometime during the, in, in the 19th century with the stone being robbed out. You also see 19th century burials within the church. Over here. As we move through the choir, where the ordained, monk, ordained friars uh, would, would have sat during mass and the various offices of the day, we move through and we're moving into the sanctuary area where the high altar would have been located. Just here, presumably a stone altar. To the north of the high altar, we have the remains of the founder's tomb. This is where Phelim O'Connor, the King of Connacht, was buried when he died in 1265. His family um, put this carved effigy over his grave. Founders, lay founders like Phelim O'Connor, had the right to burial on the uh, northern side or gospel side of the sanctuary. The effigy is, I think it's the left hand, is clasping a rosary or crucifix, holiness, and then the right hand is holding a royal wand of office, probably with a fleur-de-lis, okay? Uh, the effigy, the figure in the effigy has long robes and his feet are resting on a dog while his head is resting on some form of pillow. This effigy is depicting a royal personage. So we think that Phelim O'Connor's son, Hugh, is making a statement about the royal nature or the royal, if you like, the, the, the uh, royal nature of the O'Connor line who are then under pressure from uh, the Anglo-Normans. But it's reminding everybody that the O'Connors are a royal line and that Phelim was a king uh, in, in his, in his, in his uh, lifetime. So to me, it's a form of propaganda. Now, there's quite a lot of argument about this tomb and what it represents, but that's what I see it. I actually see it as a symbol of resistance. To me, the idea that uh, Phelim's family are placing an effigy of a king of European stature over his grave is a statement uh, about them and their position in the world. But at that stage, they're under threat from Anglo-Norman stroke English encroachments. So if we move on, as I said, the stone altar, would, great high altar, would have been here. To our left, we can see a corbel that would have, uh, well, would have held a statue maybe of St. Dominic. We can see on the other side as well, there was probably a statue to probably Dominican saint like St. Peter Martyr. As I say, the altar would have been here, lit by three lancets. Now, what we're, the window we're looking at at present is a 15th century tracery inserted window to the left and to the right. You can see the remains of the blocked up lancet windows. So originally, just like the west gable wall of the nave, we would have had three long lancets overlooking the high altar. Again, each morning, the first officers of the, the day, light would come in, obviously, to help those saying mass, the Dominican friars, but also, of course, the altar in the east gable, lit by the rising sun, is symbolic of the risen Christ. Okay, if we turn to our right, we can see the remains of the piscina. Now, obviously, this has been restored um, at some stage in the last century. 
but most of it is original. A piscina was a niche for washing holy vessels. And you can see the rosette, rosette um, and then the drain hole where the, where the sacred water, if you like, would have drained into the body of the church. You couldn't just throw out that, that, you know, that, that, that water. But anyway, here's the piscina. How do we know it's 13th century? Well, again, if you look here, you can see the striations. And that is what we call diagonal tooling. You see the striations just there? Diagonal tooling. And that is classic 13th century uh, stone dressing. Okay, so we know this is original. We move down a little bit and we can see another niche, which again has been restored in the last hundred years or so. But this is the sedilia. And originally there would have been a bench here for the clergy, for the Dominican friars saying mass. This is where they would have sat during the service, when, whenever they sat down. So the sedilia uh, w w w was a seat uh, space, a, a wooden a seat would have uh, existed here. If we move down this southern wall of the choir, we see um, the remains of one side of a doorway. And we believe that to be the part of the doorway into the sacristy, which would have lay to the south of the original friary. The sacristy would have been where the holy vessels and vestments and books used in mass and the various offices that the Dominicans would have carried out uh, during the day and night. I mean, they were getting up uh, a couple of times during the night as well to, to say various uh, offices, but the sacristy would have lain directly to our south, behind the sedilia. And um, that, that's it. What, what's interesting about the sacristy in this building is that it appears, there appears to have been a room overhead. Um, and it's been argued by my colleague Dan Titch Tyler, who did the reconstruction drawings for the guidebook, that that room, because it was well lit, you know, with an east and south, south facing, would have possibly maybe been a scriptorium, but that, that's maybe uh, interesting. So going down the wall, we see a blocked up doorway, and that was the doorway from the church into the claustral buildings to our south. So what were the claustral buildings? The claustral buildings were the administrative and residential part of the friary. We're in the church, the church is the one that's surviving, but the claustral buildings lay to the south and that's where the monks live, sorry, the friars lived, ate, and carried out daily chores. Right, so we've looked through the original Dominican Priory as built in the mid 13th century, built over a four year period, we think. Remember that there are claustral buildings to our south, so not just the church when you're visiting here, uh, you, you know, remember that. But now we're moving on to that 15th century phase. And in 1445, we hear that a papal indulgence was granted to allow people donate money and resources to the Dominicans here to repair the Priory because it had been damaged by war. The west wall of the nave that we see behind us, the original lancets, the left and right hand one, were blocked up and a, the central lancet window was destroyed and a massive traceried window, four lights in width, was inserted. 
a very, very fine window. Flowing tracery, all joined together. But if we look on the northern side of the divide between the choir and the uh, 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 nave, we find that an extension known as a transept was built on to the north wall of the church. Quite a large transept. So what, in, why did they do that? Well, one reason is that two extra altars would have been placed under the east windows in this extension and extra masses could have been said a day for various local worthies or the or deceased local worthies which would have increased I suppose the income that came into the Dominican Priory. We know that there was originally a tracery window in that north large pointed north window but again that seems to have uh, been demolished in the 19th century. So a tracery window quite similar to the one we just discussed that was inserted into the west uh, gable of uh, the Priory Church. Classic 15th century stone dressing. You can see up there dressed stone in 15th century style, maybe late 14th, 15th, 16th century style, known as punch dressing. So a different form of dressing is now used to dress the stone on arches and doorways. Again, we know from antiquarian sources, late 18th century drawings of Roscommon Priory, that a tower was placed between the choir and the nave, a three-story tower. From my reading of the 18th, late 18th century drawing, or understanding of the late 18th century drawing, it was very similar to the tower at Barshahul Abbey in County um, Mayo, and different to the average Dominican Franciscan tower at the time in so far that it ex the tower extended right across uh, the, ch the church. Um, uh, but it was three stories in height. We think maybe the prior's room would have been at first floor level. But remember, you know, that, that creates a, a, an even greater divide, if you like, between the nave for the laity and the choir for the uh, ordained friars, Dominican friars, but the wooden wood root screen, I'd say, still existed, dividing the two, but now there was a three-story tower as well, and that tower fell down in the late 18th and 19th century, and the stone, like so much of the stone here, was carted away and presumably used for building purposes in Roscommon town. Just like the west gable of the church the original 13th century lancets were either destroyed or blocked up and an absolutely massive tracery window was put in here circa 1445, 1450 in my opinion. And there it is. Now originally it was five lights in width and a whole load of sort of flowing tracery would have uh, existed uh, in its it, it, uh, sort of upper bits. Okay, so a very fine window uh, was inserted. We also see something else. The sedilia was clearly, um, work was carried out on it, and these finials that we see just here, carved finials, are also 15th century work. We think again, we're not 100% sure, but we think again sometime around the middle of the century. Now, lastly, lastly, we come back to the founder's tomb. And as I said to you, this frontal does not belong to Phelim O'Connor's tomb. It comes from another tomb. And when we look at its detail, we realize that it is also 
late medieval indeed, possibly 15th century. Our feeling is that it's the end parts, the two end parts, we can see um, they're not joined together of a tomb that may be existed, that may be existed in the uh, transept. And I was just moved here when this whole area was restored in the late 19th century. Let's just summarize then 15th century rebuilding. We know that windows were inserted in the east gable above the high altar, the west gable as well, another one. A transept was built on the northern side of the Priory Church. We have a, th a very fine three-story high tower built uh, between the choir and the nave. We have evidence of a very finely ornately carved tomb, which by the way may be the tomb of Tyg O'Connor Rowe. We also have uh, strong hints that the claustral area was partly rebuilt. The buildings to our south, of which only the, really the foundations can be seen today. Okay, well, what does all this mean? Well, one of the things about places like Roscommon that lay in Gaelic Ireland, in other words, the parts of Ireland that remained under the, con the control of Gaelic princes, native Irish, Gaelic Irish princes and lords, is that we have very little in the way of detailed surviving socio-economic documents. The equivalent of, we'll say, of manorial extents or inquisitions post-mortem. There isn't a lot of really detailed information, okay? And this has led some people to say, we're talking about Roscommon, but specifically say about Gaelic Ireland, that somehow it was not terribly well developed in the 15th century. Um, specifically, somebody said, because there's no references or real references to much in the way of economic activity uh, at Roscommon in the 15th century, nothing really uh, was happening. Now, firstly, we can say that from the point of view, the physical remains of the Priory, that this was not the case. To be able to carry out that level of rebuilding in the 15th century, remembering that the Dominicans had little in the way of property themselves, is an indication that Roscommon and its area possessed the resources and wealth. The archaeology is showing us that there was massive rebuilding here, and that is an indication of wealth in the area in the 15th century. So Gaelic Roscommon, under people like the O'Connors and McDermott's, was a much richer place than, we'll say, the surviving documents would suggest. So that's the importance of what we're looking at here. I mean, I might add that Leask, looking at the window over my, my head, Leask, the great architectural historian of 20th century Ireland, reckoned that the east window at Roscommon, as inserted into the east gable above the main altar in the 15th century, was one of the finest windows in the country. Now that's fantastic. But that's an indication, has to be an indication of wealth. So if you like, archaeology, the architecture, is telling us something different and telling us more about Roscommon than the historical documents do at the time.